So the second talk of Thai Paris this summer, and um, Mathieu will handle this very very well. So your turn. I have two mics again. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's the color. Yes. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, Rejanet talked about how type can be the fuel for, for freedom. And uh, I think we're about to go to the gas station and refuel the, the tank. Um, so Alex, you're from Barcelona. You now live and work in, in New York. Uh, so thank you for, for being here with us. Uh, you're a graphic designer a type designer, a lettering artist, some people say you're a wizard. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but I think I can say that you've worked with many brands, music artists, magazines, and newspaper. And again, like Gajane, the, the list of awards you, you won is way too long, and I've been instructed to keep the introduction short, so I'll skip through these. Uh, but looking at your work, it, it is clear that, like Gajane, you like to push the boundaries and, and go where no one has gone before. So everyone, forget everything you know about seeing and reading, and welcome Alex Trochu. Merci. Bonjour, je m'appelle Alex Trochu. That's all the French I know. But I do have a French surname. And, um, for that, uh, for that reason, I would like to... We planned this very well, Jean-Francois, and it's not working now. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Um, I think now it's going to work. Yes. This is my grandfather. Um, I also would like to, like uh, Rejan, uh, give a little bit of background. Um, my grandfather was born in Barcelona, but he came from, from France. Uh, his father uh, um, escaped from the First World War, and uh, he was a printer for the for the army. And uh, he he rejected to to die in the war, so uh, he moved to to Spain. And he didn't have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about Spanish or or either um, a, a lot of money. But he was a very good printer. And uh, little by little, he got like into uh, building his own company in Barcelona. And uh, fast forward in 1920, uh, Joan Trochu was, was born. And this is when Joan Trochu was 10 years old. He lived in an environment full of printers, ink, and these sort of examples that uh, they were coming from the, from the Bauhaus. Uh, they were imported a little bit from Germany. And uh, it was this idea of uh, reduction in the ornament and uh, trying to go back to basics. And, um, or just go to basics, because there was no back. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but uh, at that time, it was very common to just play with geometric shapes that allow you to construct either typography or illustration. So everything was connected. So we can see that like, this triangle could make the same use for a letter E or the tip of the boat. And uh, these somehow created like these wonderful connections in limitations. So the limitation create harmony. And he, as a, as a young kid and as the son of the printer, was sort of like induced to create his own modular system. But somehow he wanted to create something way more complex in terms of like the shapes. And he decided to dissect the letters in terms of uh, taking different proportions and uh, kind of like dividing, you could see in the sketches from different proportions over here, but little by little, he's dissecting it in different parts. So he's cutting every letter in different ways. And not only using geometry, but also he wanted to use uh, a more expressive take on it. So he was taking like more a calligraphy use of, the, of a structure. So he was doing something very functional, but at the same time um, with that Latin sort of like take. They call it the Latin um, graphism, what he did in, in Spain back then. This was in the 40s, 42. He created this massive modular system. It was uh, 250 pieces, more or less, and they were like a Lego, like everything kind of like connected, like a, 
like a, a puzzle, giant puzzle. And this was only one font, but the font was called Super Tipo Veloz because it allowed you to have uh, limitless options just with one character. Uh, oh no, shit, drop the beer. Um, <laughs> We just with uh, one font, you could do all kinds of uh, combinations and um, and uh, different kinds of uh, styles. And it, what it was good about it was like a global typography. And uh, nevertheless, the name Super Tipo Veloz means super fast type. This was definitely definitely not the case. It was uh, I talked with uh, letterpress designers, and they told me, "Dude, like what your grandfather did, it take like a lot of time." to actually compose, and it's definitely not a, an easy thing to, to play with. But at the time where this was released in Spain, it was just after the war, it was a very poor time for, for uh, Spain, and we know typography is never a very wealthy business, so this was kind of like a very economic way to be very uh, crafty about the results. This is an example of how, for example, uh, a modular system could work. Like here, we have this little amount of pieces that kind of range into the hat of the girl or the letters below. So everything is kind of connected and creates all these um, relationships of weights and contrast, and everything is the same, letters or, or illustration. And this is something I really like about his work, that both things were looked under the same point of view. Doesn't matter if it's... Um, illustration or letters, they are both uh, the same thing. In, 2000, in 2005, I met my, my teacher, and, um, and he, was, um, he was doing a digital version of Super Veloz. But I need to rewind a little bit at the end of the life of my grandfather. He, he died when he was 60, and he died victim of a cancer because he um, basically, it was a very bad ending for his life. All his efforts that he put into the, in the printing, uh, he was more like an artist, so he had to take a company with so many workers, and uh, letterpress was not in, in trend anymore. It was something that was completely replaced by the new technology, Offset, and uh, he hoped that his work and craft will always be minority, mi a minority craft, but he could still perform, but that was not the case. Anyway, like the perception about graphic design in my house was very bad because uh, my my grandfather ended bankrupt, and therefore my father see this as a terrible, terrible choice in life. Like uh, the moment that I told my father I'm going to do graphic design, he did everything he could to disencourage this stupid idea of mine, and um, and somehow I the genetic memory pushed me to to continue with graphic design and. And fast forward, we, we end up here with uh, 2005, where my teacher is telling me, OK, let's do a digital version of what your grandfather's work uh, was. Anyway, when I was studying, um, everybody was asking me, OK, uh, are you related to this man? And uh, I said, like, yeah, it's gra my, my grandfather. And everybody used to tell me, like, hey, the bar is very high on you. So, <laughs> so no pressure, but I wish you the best, kid. Um, anyway, we did this version, uh, in a digital version online that you could check if you guys are interested in. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to just uh, start talking more about my work. Um, I've been um, working for 10 years now as a, as a freelance designer. And I like to look at typography and, and text as an image most of the time, something that you decipher as you look. and um, and I like to move into very different techniques and, and disciplines. I don't go very deep on any of them. I like to do stuff with illustration, lettering, art direction, graphic design, photography, 3D. And, and mostly I like to get lost in every project. That's kind of like my goal. Um, I'm more seduced by style rather than ideas. Many times the ideas are the consequence of, of a style of your choice. And um, when we talk about letter design or like uh, um, just uh, lettering itself, I see it as like the non-verbal communication of the written medium. It's definitely not exactly what you're saying, it's all about how you are saying. And, um, and this um, way of talking or this way of looking, it becomes the message itself, no? the style becomes the message. And, um, 
I love letter design because it's kind of like a human invention that it's similar to fashion or or music because it's connected to a certain identities in society and there's always a place and time for for every typography something that is connected to 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 a certain identity for a group um, and yeah you you could tell like the letter design is kind of like choosing the right clothes for every occasion and letter designers are kind of like uh, tailor um, um, their job is doing tailor-made uh, suits for every project no and this is what I really enjoy more about, uh, about my job, just trying to understand what is the personality of the brand and, and trying to create this uh, uh, very specific content through a visual image. So I always like to do talks because it kind of like force you to analyze what you're doing and why you're doing it. Today was a good example when we were doing this improvised workshop. Uh, I was explaining things but without uh, having a lot of preparation. So when I do a talk, um, I think it's great because you, you need to force yourself to rationalize your ideas. So for this talk, I decided to do like some ideas in red and then inspiration images on, on, um, on green. And uh, as an example, I would say like knowledge is power. I think um, everybody that does design knows that the rules are the most important thing that uh, we always need to follow. And, and design is not something you can just improvise on. You need to understand the rules in order to, to do it right. But no, it's a, I don't really agree with that at all. I think uh, ignorance is what really creates the magic. When you are completely clueless about what you're doing and you're stepping into the process with that will of discovery. And somehow the first time you do something is the time that you're more excited about it because you have no idea what it's going to look like. As opposed when you know something and you have done it thousands of times, somehow you end up being a little bit lazy about it and unsurprised and your quali quality some sort of like loses a little bit of that drive. And that excitement always, that surprise, it's carried to the final result, I think, somehow. So that's very important for me to step into every project with uh, a goal of discovering something new. This is an example of how this clue cluelessness happens somehow. This is um, uh, the cover of the magazine. Of course, you guys know it up. And it was uh, the version in Spain. And uh, they invited me to do the, the cover for it. And uh, at that time, I thought, I want to do something based on Charles Bourne's shading, what we see on the hair of the girl that has this black and white thinking. And um, I was very inspired by the idea of like doing something that I didn't even know how it was called. It's called script lettering. I really like this sort of letters that they're very old school and they remind me of baseball uh, logos and beers from the US. And uh, this is me in 2007 doing a very crappy sketch about this idea of like all this cool doing this wordplay. And then jumping in the computer very quick and, um, and doing uh, what I wanted to really do, just like do the shading of the, of the black and white that we see on the, on the shadows of the O. And, uh, and here again, it's another example of how I was working with a tool that is not supposed to produce the results that I, I was trying to get. In this case, uh, I was working with a mouse, so there was no flow, I was not working with a pen properly, I didn't know proportions. But uh, what happened is like I still wanted to do the old school vibe. So what I did it was try to geometrize the whole composition so everything is kind of like based on circles after that. And I was like, OK, I don't know how to do uh, this uh, calligraphic style or script lettering, whatever. But I'm going to do it like all geometric. So I'm going to place it in this grid, in a xenometric grid. And um, it's not 100% correct, of course. But I'm so happy that this was a happy accident. Somehow I didn't get the teachers or the, um, the I didn't read the books, that's for sure about lettering, but somehow this stubbornness um, end up bringing a new, more unconventional result. So this is a good example of what I'm aiming in every project, to discover something that uh, hasn't been done before or like that you haven't uh, taken as a new experience. But that being said, I do believe knowledge is power. And uh, it's definitely very important to, to know the rules before you start trying to break them. 
Um, and I was lucky enough in New York to work uh, in a few workshops with Ken Barber. And uh, he was like a mind-blowing um, um, eye-opener because I could understand very well how the ductus of, of the letters work and how to draw things properly from a, an academic point of view. And from here, start to create like more classic um, takes on lettering. This is an example of taking a little bit that knowledge into the logo of a restaurant in Barcelona. It's called El Mama, but uh, at nighttime, it has a cocktail bar. It's called La Papa. And uh, for the ones that you don't know what La Papa means, it's uh, in Spanish means uh, not catching a potato. It's more like uh, when you go on a bender or you kind of like, um, you, you party like there's no mañana. And, uh, and uh, it was a very fun uh, logo because um, it kind of like represents like two personalities and the genders are opposed and the number of letters is, uh, is completely the same and it kind of like allows for a lot of symmetry in the opposite. It's kind of like a yin and yang sort of thing. So when I work with lettering, I really like to work with this idea of puzzle, something that you uh, make the, the reader play with, something that you kind of like push the, the limits of readability in order to uh, make the reader discover something. And I do agree a lot with uh, Regen has said, like uh, readability is dependent on the goal. It's never, being unreadable is never uh, a goal, but it's a consequence of trying to seduce with the image and trying to create an impact. So uh, this was a little bit the process of working with, this, uh, with these two logos that I had to go by, hand by hand and uh, little by little working with the two logos, the two images started to appear. There was like um, two skulls, two faces that were completely blurred by the, by the font. So you don't really see the, the face, but you, you understand that it's kind of like a, a flamboyant or like elegant take on, on the logo, but uh, covered by, by this uh, uh, old school lettering. And this is a little bit the rules behind the, the logo. is kind of like a, a symmetric uh, opposite proportion. One is like a script lettering, and the other one is more like a like um, slap uh, serif in uppercase. And yeah, to be honest, in the end, I feel like all that you try to do is try to find your north. and. Uh, and the North, <laughs> it's all about uh, having, having fun, of course, no? When it's easy, it's boring. When you've done it many times, it's boring. When you don't like it, it's... And change, in the end, represents that fun and how you try to challenge yourself, no, constantly. To me, fun is somewhere between readable and abstract, where you can just show something and present it in a way that uh, at least you, you haven't done before, or something that kind of like pushes um, the reading medium to a place where, okay, I like this, but I didn't know I liked it. Um, I haven't seen this before. Or something that kind of uh, pushes you to, to look at things in, in a different way. And when I look uh, at uh, 2D graphics, I kind of like always like to make them 3D. Um, and when I work with 3D, I try to make them 2D. For some reason, I prefer like to make it like very very um, flat. This was inspired by the Woolmark logo, the, the 20. And um, the 20 is actually, they say that this uh, uh, Woolmark logo was made out of um, a fork in a restaurant. Franco Grignani uh, just got the fork and he did uh, three strokes. Um, and using that angle, he sort of like create the whole idea of how that could work. And um, and under this idea of like doing a volumetric sort of like ribbon, in this case it's a circle, but out of like a triangle. Uh, also, I play with like other shapes like this, where we have like a, a square, or in this case it's just like uh, a G, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of debate uh, on this one. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I find a partner in crime, though, with this project for Penguin Galaxy, which was uh, redesigning six titles uh, of uh, sci-fi classics, except the ones on Future King, which was more uh, fiction, but not science. Um, but yeah, here you have the example of the previous covers. Uh, as you can see, all the covers, they have a very heavy uh, illustration um, punch. And typography is always left a little bit as the, as the placeholder, something that to inform, but not really to, to seduce. And I love about the art director in this project, who was uh, Paul Buckley, who said like, okay, the limitation is you cannot use any illustration. Everything needs to be said on the type, and you need to create a, a collection that has a consistent style, but every title needs to be uh, represented by, by the font that you're going to use. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them. 2001, Space Odyssey. Everybody knows the story, but uh, I'm sure nobody gets it. Because uh, bottom line, is the purpose of it is creating this enigma of something that is beyond human comprehension. And this was a little bit the idea of like maybe the first sketch is like why don't we play with some like hieroglyphic of alien society that uh, we cannot really read and invite the reader into when he turns the book you'll be able to see a 2001 Space Odyssey but um, kind of like incitating with this with this game where like okay the the book is representing this sort of enigma that is very hard to resolve therefore you cannot read it. Um, I presented this idea about the, the cover you cannot read, and uh, the publisher did not love it. <laughs> but, uh, but somehow we end up here, and, and I think it was a very good compromise for them, and I, I'm still admiring the balls that, that they had for, for doing this, for, for a title like this. And, um, and yeah, we're very happy with, with the result. The, the back covers always is a sequence that represents a second part of what we see in the cover, or there's an icon that kind of like closes the, the idea. Um, Dune, the other title I wanted to talk to you about. It's, uh, if uh, you know the story, is uh, this planet in the galaxy is kind of the Iraq of the galaxy. There's uh, there's oil, there's the spice, like a lot of political uh, interest in the place, and and it kind of like has a very like uh, epic uh, take on on the on the way that it's it's expressed, and it's kind of like a medieval story in a way. Um, the first take on the letters were kind of like representing this idea of like um, waves that you could see like a little bit here or in the desert, and and making it kind of like a metallic sort of uh, um, armor. But then, every now and then, things happen. When you're working with type, your ideas don't matter, because they always are subjected to what the letters allow you to do. So you always need to look what's in the structure that you're playing with, and look for something that uh, could be good. And uh, in this case, could not have been better. Like, this was a very, very lucky uh, encounter where Dune itself it was a perfect word where like every shape um, just by rotating it it represented the, the the concept of this intelligent game and all that stuff readability was not good enough so <laughs> we end up here um, but we put this in the in the back cover which uh, it was good enough for me This was all made with uh, foil paper, and, uh, and the covers are uh, different colors. And uh, they're all these different foils, and every cover represents like a different concept for, for every book. And then the back covers, they have these icons. I didn't like the idea of having uh, dust uh, covers on the jackets. And, uh, because uh, I always feel like once you have those, you want to remove them. You want to enjoy the, the hardcover itself. Um, so we designed like this uh, little box where you can put the, the titles in. And again, I feel like I'm, my, I'm not an artist. I just need like a unique style many times. And I'm not so much uh, about uh, having a message to express, but I really like to express with a message. You know? And 
in this idea, I, I wanted always to experiment and try to find like new ways to continue to, to find something that evolves in your work. So I've been obsessed lately in the idea of like trying to bring color to stuff like this that we just saw. And um, I was like uh, separating uh, images like this number three with the channel. So it kind of like gives this effect of like the rainbow, like it dissects, dissects the colors in different uh, primary colors. And then I was thinking, okay, so if these circles look like this, maybe if we like flat them down, this could be strokes that could have color. The colors itself could have color. So I was experimenting a lot with like brushes that could be made out of like different breaks in colors and see how the color would appear. And, um, and then these are like some different variations based on, on this sort of stuff that hasn't been placed into a particular use yet, but this is how I divide a lot my, my time between commissions and and projects that they're just kind of like experimental things that you enjoy doing uh, by yourself. In this case, this is kind of like um, just uh, working with this idea of these strokes that they are like rotating on different colors and how the color kind of like rays. And this is playing with 3D and working with the idea. This is a number five and uh, rotating it. I call this effect the Cruz Diet effect because uh, it definitely it has a lot of connection with his work. Uh, somehow, when you work with lines and separating in the RGB, it's kind of like uh, just kind of like what happens. So I I call this what uh, what the name should be is like his his own effect in um, in this sort of like separation of color. Um, this is another example of uh, working with uh, some record cover in this case for a band that is three members and I feel like music somehow when you are like playing with a band it's kind of like a overlapping different sounds different patterns and they create something new together no but separate they're kind of like dull or like uh, unreadable and this is the the effect no of the cover that uh, if you look for long enough you might read the the name of the band um, the band is called Alagoas in case you could not read it so <laughs> um, but funny enough, it got nominated for a Grammy, so we're like blown away for for that uh, that honor. We're still shocked. Um, and this is another experiment. In this case, is uh, the idea of like the normal maps that I really like. Now that I'm kind of like working more with 3D and how to put normal maps in like maybe like objects and like just look at a physical object and try to represent that 3D-ness in it. Um, this is a, an example of how to do that. I don't know what, I have this music in the background. This is my studio music. Um, but yeah, I was playing with sprays and the sprays kind of like react, uh, they are replace uh, like light. So the light, um, the sprays look like light. So you have like three angles, one coming from the top, below on the side. And this sort of like generates this idea of iridescence in the, um, in the images. And this was kind of like a big library of objects and images that was used later for music posters and, and um, other, um, other stuff. This is another project in this case for Adobe. Uh, they were doing this project called Adobe Remix the purpose of it was not very clear in terms of concept. It was more kind of like creating a visual image that has something appealing to look at, something that is interesting. And I discovered this product called Neverwet, which is a spray that you basically, it's not very, um, I wouldn't recommend it for any of the things that they recommend. <laughs> but uh, somehow it's great for uh, making fun art projects, especially with liquid. And uh, if you want to create any surface, and uh, basically the, the liquid will be repelled in anywhere that the spray is being placed. So this is where the spray, the spray is, and these holes were like stencils where it was not placed. So you could like kind of control the liquid exactly where you want it. And somehow here is the Adobe logo. 
Also, this is a, a gig poster. I do a lot of projects sometimes uh, for gig posters just for fun, to experiment. It's a good opportunity to, to do something you haven't done before with great content that comes from bands that you love, in this case, Arcade Fire. And the idea was to just create some context for um, uh, rock and roll music and, and the take of his music was in, uh, I think it was around Neon Bible when this poster was made. And I was working with Denim. Um, if you scratch Denim sideways, you'll make the thread come out. And if you scratch it vertically, you just make a hole in your pants. So I discovered this while scratching my own pants. And I decided to do this poster like this. Um, and it's funny because it works like a grid of pixel Denim. Like the smaller you, you work, the less resolution you get. And over there, there's like a bigger size, so there was more defining of, of the letters. So it was a nice uh, way of breaking up the structure of a letter. And this is a, a gig poster for ACDC, it's kind of those bands that you cannot put your finger on the logo. It's kind of like you can just give like an environment for it. And in this case, I decided to do a bronze cast. Um, and then it was uh, worked on a certain patina to make it look old, and then with a hammer, it was kind of like uh, smashed. And then this is like the picture that it was taken with. And yeah, new tools, new results. I feel like this is kind of like something that everybody's experiencing these days. I'm 10 years working as a freelance, and I can tell like nothing that I studied in terms of programs is something I apply today. Like we are always learning new stuff every day. and. Uh, the creative of today, I think, is the one that is able to create this symbiosis with technology. And um, you cannot really do everything by yourself. Like, there's a lot of stuff that is the, the product of a team and how you make these things come together as a whole. Um, that being said, I've been very lucky to have great people around me that have been teaching me 3D. And uh, I've been starting to play around with, with this tool, and it's becoming like this amazing uh, Imagination is the limit box. It's kind of like a, an amazing, um, surprising uh, process always. Sometimes I work with modelers, in this case with uh, Leon Studio for doing graphics like this. I don't use Neverwet anymore. This is how I do it <coughs> now. Or stuff like this that uh, they can um, take a, a shader that has so much of a, of a realistic take that is something that you could uh, you could almost taste. So this is kind of like when you need to team up with with people. And these are some numbers that uh, they were made for Arvazo, uh, for a managing company of wealth. And they were presenting the numbers as art. And, and so these are like kind of um, these 3D objects that work like sculptures, but they're presenting data that is related to, to art. Number six is the happiest of all. Like people have been telling me this so many times, and I don't know if we'll see number six again. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, you can check later. <laughs> and this is some little animations that the team in-house from the agency did. And definitely, I was telling this today to you guys in the workshop. Animation is such an important need these days to present your work, and I feel like yeah, it's so important to come up with ways to incorporate that into your results. Um, we're not self-sufficient anymore. We need to create collaboration and, and make uh, the projects become uh, part of a, of a team result. This is some other example in 3D, in this case for Watson. And the good thing is like once you create a model in 3D, you can easily apply it into a volumetric object or something that you can animate. So there's an economy on the on the on the efforts that you're doing. And then, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about more like personal stuff. Like design, I think, is an act of empathy. You're always trying to put yourself into the mind of another person and try to empathize with their problems and what are their needs. And art is way more of an act of freedom. It's something that you just uh, do it because you feel it's right for you, and it's kind of like a selfish thing. And um, and this is a project I did back in the days where I come up with a technique that allowed me to have um, 
daytime images and nighttime images under the same surface. This is a bitmap of an eye. And when you close the lights, there's another image that comes in. This is basically how it works. It's, um, the red is glow in the dark. The yellow looks like glow in the dark, but doesn't glow. And then there's black ink. So the effect of this is kind of like a daytime bitmap where you have light and you see this black and white image. Then when you close the light, um, this other um, image appeared. It could be completely different. And I was working with this technique, and then I thought, OK, maybe a good way to work with this is to do portraits. I did portraits of uh, musicians that I love. Um, I was lucky enough that they wanted to, to do this, and uh, I was given like few minutes to take their pictures. And uh, this is, uh, that was John, uh, sorry, that was Acid Poly. This is John Talabot. This is James Murphy. This was at the time that he wanted to retire, so like I, I put him with uh, sunglasses in the beach. But like he's working again now, thank God. And um, this is the whole series. Um, it's Fortet, uh, Caribou, uh, Rebolledo. And we did few uh, events uh, in Barcelona. Uh, also, this was exhibited too in, in Colette once. And uh, this is Brooklyn. And yeah, these are like projects that kind of like feed your north. Like it's so important. It's not a very good business sometimes, and well, for me never. But uh, it's been so great to to do them. And I think it's so important to to just keep fueling yourself with those uh, little uh, little joy moments in your process. And this is the last thing I wanted to show you guys. I think it's an exciting new tool. And uh, since this is Type Paris, I think it's very um, related. And it's actually created by some guys from France. Uh, they're called FontSelf. And they created this tool that allows you to basically have color fonts. Anything that you can create in Illustrator, you can now um, assign a character uh, to it and work with the kerning. By all means, it's not. I'm not recommending this tool if you're doing like uh, more black and white uh, readable uh, type, but I think it's a very powerful tool for people like me, for example, that is intimidated by the typographic uh, tools that are very technical. And this one is very easy to play with. And uh, if you like color, it's kind of like fantastic. So this was the first, sorry, the first uh, sort of like mood board that I had for my font. And I really wanted to create something that had like this sort of mood, very uh, vibrant color pixelated, uh, it has like this Memphis style, very Felipe Pantone. And then work with the, with the idea of no sign and screen. These were like the color palette. So this is uh, the font design. And this is how, how easy the kerning works. So it kind of like allows you to, to do something very, very fast and easy. You just type uh, these elements that you have in Illustrator, and then they get just exported to um, to this plugin that is inside Illustrator. So you don't need to move from one program to the other. The good thing about color fonts is also that you can overlap things uh, because, of course, like the black and white, there's no, when there's white, it's actual, actual white, it's not transparent. So every color has, a, has an opacity that overlaps with the next sort of like uh, character. So the the letter O was overlapping to the D, or like the letter P to the O. This is another color font that I did that is way more uh, based on these references. I normally work with uh, mood boards that kind of like give me my map, visual map, where I want to put my work in. And, and this font is way more based on like this style and uh, Mondrian and um, Sol Lewitt. There's also like a black and white version, so you could combine both, and there's many different sort of like characters. Um, it's been just for fun. I haven't used this bef uh, at all for like uh, commercial use, but uh, it's also great to experiment with, uh, for example, with patterns. You can type patterns with this thing of color fonts, where you create every uh, character is one infinite pattern that you could just uh, type. 
So it allows you to create things very easy. So I think the dimension of color will be something that is kind of like a slippery slope to very bad typography if it's not done like uh, subtly. But the dimension of color, I feel like it can bring a lot of identity to brands, and especially now that we need to create so much content for Instagram and uh, all kinds of uh, immediate content that just expires very quick, just with one asset, one font, you can give to a client, they can just build a countless uh, amount of content. So I think it's, it's kind of like a very powerful up and coming tool that uh, I'm, I'm excited about. Um, and then very soon, you'll be able to also type uh, pixel uh, phone photography, uh, like meaning like pictures uh, made out of like renders or stuff like that, that is just um, an image that can have the, um, the text. Um, and yeah, that's the, that's the website if you want to check it out. Um, and yeah, just a reminder of this, fun is, the, is your north. And, um, and this is the last quote I would like to close with. Um, the creative mind plays with the objects it love. It's not an intellectual thing, it's more like a, a fun thing to do um, by Carl Jung. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you said your grandfather set the bar high. There is no too very high bar in, in the room. Uh, so I think we all have to come back in 50 years and see what the Trochu family is up to. And uh, I, yeah, I no, I cannot beat my grandfather. That's impossible. <laughs> but thank you very much. So again, we have like the pizzas are not here yet, so we have a little time for questions. So, yep. About the tremendous uh, books uh, you made for penguins, mm -hmm. uh, were you also in charge of the the, um, the um, uh, content? Uh, um, mm -hmm. Inside the book. In inside the book. No. 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 A uh, uh, few people had mentioned, and the first people that were mentioning this was the guys from Penguin. It's like we don't know who did this, and uh, it's a totally different take in the inside and the letters. Yeah, something we didn't decide. And if so, if they have asked you for the, the inside, would you have done it? Or? Yeah, I would just send them the vectors we already did, so they could use it. But uh, yeah, um, somehow, yeah, something that didn't di was not communicated. But uh, yeah, I'm, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that, Alex. I'm curious about your motivation. It seems like you spend a lot of your time on um, not only commercial work but personal work to better yourself and to explore things. Um, how, how do you, oh I feel like I've got a mind blank. <laughs> I explained the question before I actually remembered it. Um, how, how do you find that motivation? How do you, uh, it's, a, it's a more complex question I have than simply how do you find your motivation but maybe okay. let's just ask that for now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, um, a lot has to do with your own sensations and like how you trying to wake up every day with uh, the wheel of doing something new. So I think kind of like uh, everybody read maybe or heard about this cheesy book, no, where's my cheese? So it's kind of like this uh, very stupid principle of like things, motivation moves and you need to kind of like chase it. It will not come to you. You need to work towards it and, and try to force yourself to appear in the process. No. Like uh, Chuck Close also said, like inspiration is for amateurs. Professionals just work, and then suddenly something happens. No? Like you don't wait for something to come to you. You just work, and eventually happens. Um, I was wondering what your process was. Do you mm -hmm. do a quick rush, or mm -hmm. do you always draw precisely what you want? It depends. Like many times, I I need some sketch to get started or some idea. But uh, yeah, I'm very clueless sometimes about what's gonna be in the end. And if there's something, I'm kind of like a drifter. I really like to allow 
the, the style to dictate uh, what is the best idea, not the opposite around. Like I don't have an idea and then I try to look for a style to match it. So there's a little bit of like that communication between style and, and idea. And you want the, the style to be flowing very naturally into the idea. No? Certain things, especially with letter forms, the forms need to kind of like tell you something of like this is going to flow if you have this shape over here rather than this other. And maybe the shape looks like this form that is object and then you have an idea because this object represents something that it connects with uh, with the book so or the whatever project you're doing so um, I try to be as open as possible but yeah normally I sketch I have mood boards and then uh, yeah just start working Um, hello. Um, hello. You talked a lot about uh, your style, and I was wondering uh, if it happened to you that some clients came to you and told, like, I want Alex Trochu style. And if it happened, how do you manage to stay uh, close to your own style, but at the same time make something new mm -hmm. every time? Because maybe mm -hmm. some clients want the same all over again. Right. It's something I can never, I think when a client wants something, it's my duty to give them that. And I cannot, uh, I, the, the years go by and I'm more detached from my own uh, feelings towards projects. I became more of like, when I'm a designer, I just like, I provide a service. This is what you want, I'll give you this. If you want something way more open and you're into this collaboration, I'm so happy about it and we'll come up with something together. But uh, kind of like I, I'm the attached a little bit with my own things, and then I put my time in my own risk, and uh, and then put it in your channels of Instagram or like anything, and maybe a client will go and say like, can we do this now? It's like yes, perfect. But uh, it kind of like I'm I'm a designer, and I just try to please as much as I can in that sense what the client needs. I'm afraid my English will, will not be very good, but I'm interesting so far. Yeah, <laughs> I'm interesting. I'm interested in the way you're not working just from the client, but from elsewhere. Your background, grandfather, mm -hmm. or the artistic scene. You see, like you were citing uh, Cruz Diaz or mm -hmm. uh, Bridget Riley, for example, or Sir Lewitt. Uh, but it seems for me it was in a formal way. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering two, two things for, for the style. Just wondering if you have connection with Sir Lewitt in the formal way. You see the, the stripes, uh, horizontal, vertical, and uh, uh, diagonal ones, but not with the process mm -hmm. to be the author and not the author. You right. see, like uh, that. Mm -hmm. And for. Just jumping over the question of style, I was thinking about Gerhard Richter, who has, mm -hmm. who has no styles, but yeah. several styles. Right. And thanks, uh, I, uh, I just think, he, f f for me, it's, it's, it's a little look, uh, your work seems a little uh, a style, but which is not a style, unique, but uh, complex of styles. It remembers me, uh, Gerhard Richter, for example, in the painting field. Yeah. Well, you, you, you agree with that and with Sol Lewitt, yeah? I mean, in the case of Sol Lewitt, for example, i never been such a fan of um, conceptual mm. art. But somehow, uh, his way of uh, expressing the idea that the idea is a machine um, uh, that makes the art, I, I really like that, that concept and somehow uh, that triggered me to create something that is visually connected to it. But in the end, I do a lot of like approaches to styles that I love from art and people that I admire. But at the end, I'm just doing letters. I haven't found out like a way to put up my own content. You know, like I always work with content that it's uh, created by by clients, and I make it look 
like something that I enjoy, but I haven't found really like something that is uh, uh, my true idea behind the style. So in that sense, I, I enjoy a lot just living in the surface and having a, a very light jacket that I can just put in and out and enjoy that art direction sort of thing that goes from one thing to the other. Um, and I like that. But, uh, but yeah, hopefully maybe someday I will be able to create a language that is more my own, that is more connected with, with an idea that uh, hasn't, hasn't happened yet, no. Um, and what was your other question about Richter? Are ah, they different yeah, yeah, styles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I answered yeah, yeah. both. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was about Gerhard Richter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I try to have like collect as many different um, um, sort of like uh, clients. Many times they just reference certain things, and some things after ten years they're like, we cannot do this anymore. It's completely expired. It doesn't have any meaning today. But sometimes some other styles they seem to keep evolving, and they're being digested in in different ways. So. And there's some of them that keep having some parallel personalities that they keep growing. But uh, yeah, without like this idea of like I don't have a message. It's more like I express with a message. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. I have a question. You've got um, client ask you to do. Um, um, Troshu style or no? You hide out to do that, but does someone? ask you to reproduce Tirsa style? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, I see Tirsa all the time in my boot boards. <laughs> okay, so I, I know... Hello. <laughs> I, I know why Jean-Francois is asking the question. is because Tirsa is in the room. Yeah, yeah I've seen it. <laughs> and Tirsa was the, the first speaker ever at Thai Paris. Nice. So he wants a picture of you two together on stage. So. Let's do it. I'm sorry, Tirsa. Yeah, right now. You know, you know Jean-François. There is no way around it. Good to see you too. Yeah. How's everything? I'm good. You really want the photos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need the photo. <laughs> Instagram, bien sûr, important. <laughs> Super gênant votre histoire. <laughs> It's good to hear you. Really. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Thank Alex. You. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Only 14 years after its birth, the iconic Bauhaus School of Design was shut down by the Nazi regime. Many treasures and unfinished masterpieces were left behind, lost to the world. Founded on the central idea of training a new generation of artists to create a better world, Bauhaus laid the foundation for modern design as we know it and changed creativity forever. But in 1930s Germany, the progressive ideas of the Bauhaus were considered threatening and the school's closure became inevitable. But sometimes, what's been lost to history can be brought back. The influence of Bauhaus lives on, and now you 
can design with a piece of living history.